Remember the Tremolos 1950s hit, Silence is Golden? I personally do not. Or Elvis's A Little Less Conversation? That one I know. Or Shut Up, Just Shut Up by the Black Eyed Peas? There are probably three people in here who know that song, but I am one of them. Anyway, the theme is, you get the idea, our next speaker, Judy Bernthorn from the Network's New Orleans law firm, firm of Deutsch Kerrigan, Gerrig, ugh, sorry, Deutsch Kerrigan is going to speak to you about those situations where uh, ethical rules require your attorney to keep silent over something. Please welcome Judy Bernthorn. Thank you all for staying with us and being here with me on such a beautiful, sunny Friday afternoon for ethics. Um, as you can see, there were two titles to this speech. One was Shut Your Mouth, which is very proper, but when I submitted it, it had a little New Orleans twang to it, and it said, Shut Your Mouth, which has a little bit of yat in it. And um, I can tell you that the inspiration for this came from just years and years of what I do, which is getting involved as appointed defense counsel. Typically, a carrier will hire Deutsch Kerrigan, hire me to come in and defend a CPA or a lawyer or a director and so much has happened already when I get the call when I get the email um, things have already happened the lawsuit has already been filed um, typically the insured has already sent a notice of claim to the carrier saying please indemnify me if there's a judgment please defend me right now the carrier has already written back saying, okay, I'll give you a defense. Sometimes the carrier has sent a reservation of rights letter when I get involved. Sometimes there's even been settlement negotiations before I even get an email or a call involving me in the case. So pretty much my hands have been tied for a long time. There are things I always want to say, maybe to the carrier saying, do you really want to send that reservation of rights letter because you're going to create a conflict of interest, you're going to make yourself have to hire two lawyers instead of one, and it just might not be worth it in this case. So there are things I haven't been able to say forever, and I'm glad to get here with you, be able to vent a little bit and talk about some of these things. Um, in terms of ethics, what we're going to talk about is, to a great extent, uh, Rule 1.6. and. Rule 1.6 really says that a lawyer shall not reveal information relating to the representation of a client unless the client consents after consultation. I know we've all heard that. And it sounds like it's easy to interpret, but it's not. Um, one of the things that I saw in getting ready for this and updating all my authorities was a very interesting, I thought it was interesting, um, disciplinary proceeding that was in Reese Schaefer. It's reported at 149 Washington 2nd, 148. And so since it's Friday afternoon, I'll tell you a story about Attorney Schaefer. Attorney Schaefer turned out to be a whistleblower. Um, what happened with Attorney Schaefer is that his client called him up and said, Schaefer, I need you to get involved really quick because I have this bowling alley and I want to buy it. And um, it turns out that there's an estate that's been going on for years. And even though this estate has been going on for years, it needs to be wrapped up really quickly because the estate representative who's handling it, that's an attorney. That estate representative, he just recently got appointed to the bench and he's going to be a judge. He needs to want, he's been milking this estate for years, but now he needs to wind it up quickly. And he's going to give me a really good price to buy this bowling alley. Now, I'm going to have to pay him back when he gets on the bench, but that's later. For right now, Attorney Schaefer, I need you to come on in and form a corporation for me to buy the bowling alley and do the sale transaction for me. So Schaefer did what he was supposed to do. He formed the corporation, the sale went through, and the estate representative took the bench. He was a judge, and Attorney Schaefer continued to practice law sometimes in front of this judge. Well, Schaefer was practicing before this judge one day, and the judge really was not persuaded by any of the authorities that Attorney Schaefer offered. The judge said, Schaefer, that's frivolous, that has no merit, and in fact, Schaefer, I'm going to sanction your client $1,000 just for making that argument. Well, Schaefer was very upset. He went back to his office, and what did he do? He pulled out the bowling alley file. This is true. He pulled out the file. He wrote down the names. He started calling people to ask questions about this judge. He went to the public records. 
He researched this judge to see what other kinds of things this judge had been doing before taking the bench. This shaper even called the ex-wife of the judge and asked her, hey, what's going on? Is there anything suspicious? And she said, hey, yeah, by the way, there was a Cadillac that he got under suspicious circumstances. You might want to look into that. So the old client comes in and says, look, I've gotten wind, Shaper. You've been you know, kicking up some dirt and looking into some things. And all that stuff that I told you about this judge milking that estate, about me having to pay that judge back, that was all confidential. Now, you might not have thought it was privileged. You might not have thought it had anything to do with the bowling alley, but I meant for it to be privileged. I meant for it to be confidential. So shut your mouth. Don't say anything about it. Well, Schaefer was a whistleblower, so he really believed that there were some exceptions in Rule 1.6, and they were going to help him out. So he continued on, and Schaefer made an appointment with the Judicial Commission, and he gave his whole file on this judge to the Judicial Commission. Schaefer met with the FBI. He gave his whole file to the FBI, and Schaefer even went to the DA and gave the file to the DA. Well, Schaefer was right, but I'm not sure it did him much good because this judge got kicked off the bench. The Judicial Commission kicked the judge off the bench. Not only that, um, they disbarred this judge and he couldn't practice law for two years. But the client was outraged, and the client filed a disciplinary case against Schaefer. And the client said, you shouldn't have done that. It was confidential. And the disciplinary commission agreed. Schaefer was disbarred for six months. So he was a whistleblower. He was right. And he was not practicing for six months. This kind of tells us something about Rule 1.6. There might be something you're talking to your client about. It may just seem like gossip. It may, it may be small talk. But you don't know how your client is really seeing it. And in this case, Schaefer really had a heads up because the client wrote him saying, hey, this is confidential. Keep your mouth shut. Schaefer didn't listen. In our cases, we might not have a heads up from the client. That rule 1.6 puts the burden on us. It says that we can only reveal the confidential information unless the client consents after consultation. We need to go to the client to ask. We can't sit back and wait for the client to come to us. So we need to be really careful about Rule 1.6. And as appointed defense counsel, we need to be careful about the tension between Rule 1.6 and Rule 1.4. Model Rule 1.4 really relates to communication. And it says the lawyer must keep the client reasonably informed about the status and substance of the representation. Well, this is great, but when you are appointed defense counsel and you're representing the insured, there may be some things the insured doesn't necessarily want the insurance carrier to know. The ABA has addressed this with uh, an opinion, opinion 08450, which is in your materials. And the ABA says if a lawyer would violate his duty under 1.4 to the insurer client by failing to disclose the information, but is prohibited from disclosing the information by Rule 1.6, the lawyer may have to withdraw. Well, that's great for the lawyer. You know, he might withdraw, but the um, attorney who comes in next might have the exact same situation. It's a tension that we deal with every day as appointed defense counsel. And the various ways that we can see this come up in a case, it might come up relating to a cooperation clause or a hammer clause or a reservation of rights letter. In terms of hammer clauses, um, it can come up, and there are very few cases on this subject, a hammer clause is defined in your materials. And basically, it means that if the insured unreasonably refuses to consent to a settlement recommended by the insurer, the insurer's liability may be limited to the amount of the proposed settlement plus costs and expenses incurred to date. Well, if you've had one of these cases that actually went to judgment where the insurance company sticks to its guns, I'd really like to talk to you because they come up often in litigation, but usually the insured might cave in and settle, or the insurance company might cave in and say, OK, we're going to go forward. So in terms of our topic here, what we need to know that there are authorities out there that say if you're faced with a hammer claw situation, as appointed defense counsel, you really should notify the insured and explain all the implications and all the dangers of failing to settle. Um, it's Friday afternoon, so I have to show you a cartoon as well. And this one relates to conflict of interest. In terms of reservation of rights letters, one of the main themes of reservation of rights letters is conflict of interest. 
and when there is a reservation of rights letter, in many cases, the insurance company might be required to not only appoint defense counsel, but to appoint a second counsel known as a cumis counsel or a molar counsel, an independent counsel that the insured picks in order to defend the case. Um, I practice law in Mississippi and Louisiana. There's a world of difference between the two, but the law of Mississippi is very similar to California. And a lot of Mississippi lawyers will tell you if you ask them, they'll say if there's a reservation of rights, then the carrier has to appoint a second counsel, molar counsel, that's not really true under the case law. What the case law really says is if there's a reservation of rights that creates a conflict of interest, then the carrier has to appoint a second lawyer to defend the case, somebody chosen by the insured. Um, the law of Mississippi in that regard is very similar to California where there's a lot more jurisprudence. And California has actually put this into a statute and the statute makes it clear that not every reservation of rights requires appointment of a cumis counsel or an independent counsel. Um, so if there's no conflict of interest created by the reservation of rights letter, there is no need for a cumis counsel or a molar counsel. And you think, when can that possibly happen that a reservation of rights would not create a conflict of interest? Well, it could be. And um, there are some situations that come up in California and Mississippi routinely where there's a reservation of rights, but there's no requirement of cumis counsel. And examples are punitive damages, or if there's only a danger of excess exposure. In that situation, the insured is pretty much pulling along with the insurance carrier going on the same way to defend the case, so there's no requirement of cumis counsel. There's a strain of authority in California that indicates that um, if there's a conflict of interest, it really has to be serious. And if it's not serious, you don't have to appoint cumis counsel. I wouldn't really want to hang my hat on that if I was a carrier defending a case in California. And so um, I wouldn't recommend hanging your hat on that if you're in California. Now, if we're going to go, I threw in some other states. In Florida, it's basically a presumption if, if there's a reservation of rights letter, additional counsel has to be appointed, um, regardless of whether there's actually a conflict of interest. Are there any Alabama fans in the audience? In Alabama, um, it's presumed that there is not a conflict of interest, but there's a heightened standard of care that's imposed upon the insurance carrier, and there's not necessarily a requirement for additional counsel. In Louisiana, it's similar to Alabama. There's not necessarily a requirement for independent counsel picked by the insured if there's a reservation of rights letter. For our topic, the main thing is that as appointed defense counsel, I really have to explain to the insured exactly what process is going on with the reservation of rights. That just because you're getting a defense, that doesn't mean you're going to get indemnity at the end of the road. In terms of communications, there are a lot of cases that talk about the fact that if the insurance, if the appointed defense counsel finds out about information that's going to adversely affect coverage, that should not be disclosed to the insurance carrier. That's a Rule 1.6 situation. There's surprisingly um, a lot of authority indicating that the attorney-client privilege survives the tripartite relationship. If there's appointed defense counsel, an insurance carrier, and an insured, there are actually cases that say that some information can be disclosed to the carrier and withheld from the insured. I've never actually done that. I wouldn't recommend it. But clearly, there's some information that the insured might tell me that I would not communicate to the carrier for its own good. Because if I do, it could pre create a situation of bad faith or excess exposure up over and above the insurance policy limit for the carrier. Um, there are a lot of issues relating to Rule 1.6 that come up when the insured wants to burn everything and be vindicated. Sometimes these are people who've never been sued before, and the insurance carrier might want to economize, but the insured wants to just go forward. There's a lot of authority out there on Rule 1.6 indicating that we really have to be careful with our narrative invoices. The descriptions on there could be something that's totally confidential. 
Is it okay to send that to the carrier with the way that our bills are evaluated and reviewed? That's something that really needs to be authorized by the insured. Another area is cooperation clauses. There's authority indicating that if there's a cooperation clause in the policy, which there always is, in some cases, depending on how draconian that policy is, that could in, its, in and of itself constitute consent to disclose information under Rule 1.6. There are some cooperation clauses that flat out say um, the insured absolutely has to disclose certain information on request by the insurance carrier. And those are cases like informational cooperation clauses like this. The insured shall give all such information and assistance as the insurer may reasonably require. I would want to clear it with the insured first, but that may very well be a clause that constitutes an indication that disclosure should be made under Rule 1.6. Um, there are records cooperation policies, and those are also um, cooperation clauses that may constitute the ability to disclose information on Rule 1.6. So these are all situations that come up really frequently and there are instances where you might not expect it to come up. I've had situations where this came up, it, it just you know, bit me and I was not expecting it at all. In one case I was actually defending a case, it was a jury trial in Monroe, Louisiana. We were proceeding along happily, the defendants were all together, no conflicts among defendants, and it was a bunch of director defendants being sued by a plaintiff in federal court, and we were in a jury trial, and things were starting to go well, and my client said, well, things are starting to go well, and you're talking about settlement, and the plaintiff's coming down on his demand, so what do I want you to do? I'm instructed by my client, stop negotiating, do not communicate with the insurance carrier. Well, this isn't really what I wanted to hear. It's not what I expected to hear. And you don't really want to be, you know, at night in a jury trial researching ethical rule 1.6. So you might not think about it before you go to trial, but um, yeah, the client said do not communicate. And I had been sending daily written reports to the carrier. And every, every now and then during the day, I would make a telephone call if something really important happened during trial. And so, you know, that came to a street, screeching halt. There really was no discretion because 1.6 says if your client tells you not to disclose it, you're not going to disclose it. And I didn't disclose it. I didn't communicate with the carrier. There were several trial days that were very tense and a little bit acrimonious. Um, the client was putting himself in danger of violating the cooperation clause like we've seen. The client was, you know, in danger of being hammered. Um, the other directors prevailed upon my client and I prevailed upon my client and eventually he relented and said, okay, you can report again to the carrier. And I did, and it does have a happy ending. We did all settle for an amount that we were happy with. The people who didn't settle were not happy at the end of the day. Um, but it can come up out of the blue when you're not expecting it. And there's another case that I have going on right now um, in Natchez, Mississippi, where my client, I'm appointed to defend, has instructed me, you can communicate, but everything has to be run through me. If you write a report, you send it to me. I'm the general counsel of your client, and I'm going to edit it. And then you can send it to the insurance company. And if that claims handler calls and wants to talk to you, you can talk to him, but only if I'm available to take the call with you. Now, does the insurance company know that this is happening? Yes, in this case, everything's on the table. But if you're general counsel to a company who has a malpractice policy or any kind of policy that provides a duty to defend, think about it and think about what your options are. You can tell appointed defense counsel how to communicate, when to communicate, whether to communicate. Keep it in your arsenal of things to think about and you might use it to your advantage. So look at the materials. There are cases on every different topic I've talked about, and I hope that you do think about this before it happens to you and comes up and surprises you. Thank you all very much, and I hope you all have a great weekend.